Signal is a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm your host and the Beacon's Editor-in-Chief, Cyril McGlaco. Twice a month, we'll use this space to shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. We'll talk to guests who will help listeners navigate these perilous political waters by providing insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive routes. Ralph Young is a history professor at Temple University. He is the author of Dissent, The History of an American Idea, Dissent in America, Voices That Shape the Nation, Make Art, Not War, Political Protest Posters from the 20th Century, and his newest book released in January, American Patriots, A Short History of Dissent. Today we speak with Ralph to talk about one of my favorite subjects, dissent. Hi, Ralph. Welcome to The Signal. Hi, Cyril. Well, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> You're, I'm already stumbling. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. <laughs> this is a, well, we're going to have a fun conversation. So, but b- before we get into it, before we speak about your new book, American Patriots, A Short History of Dissent, and, and just a note to readers, you, you, this isn't your first book on dissent. You've also written Dissent, The History of an American Idea, edited Dissent in America, the voices that shaped a nation. In fact, you teach about dissent in Temple University. Um, so my question to you is how and why has dissent become such a central part in your life and scholarship? Was there an event, a book, a person that maybe pushed you in this direction? Oh, there's a, a lot of things about that. I, I grew up in the, in the, I mean, it was a really important time for me. At different times, I've met people like Pete Seeger and Allen Ginsberg, who were very inspiring just to be around and talk to. And But also, you know, what really got me into dissent in the first place was um, being, you know, protesting for civil rights and protesting against the war in Vietnam. And then a few years ago, well, back, well, 20 years ago now, one of uh, the the head of the honors program at Descent, uh, at Temple University asked me if I would put together a history course for the honors program that would just be on a particular topic. And then I thought, well, what kind of theme in American history really interests me? Descent immediately came to mind. So I, I put together the course and uh, in the course, I wanted students to read the words of dissenters. You know, like Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail and such, so they could develop their own opinions about these people. And so as I taught the course, and it was just, you know, really wonderful teaching it for the first time, it was just the students really got into really great discussions. And it was around the time that we were invading Iraq and a lot of people, they were protesting about that. So, but over the, over the next few years, as I was teaching the course, I decided I had to, uh, there was no place where I could find all these documents of dissenters in one book. And so I did, did the book, this, the one Dissent in America, Voices That Shaped a Nation. And then after I did that, my uh, editor said, why don't you write a narrative history of dissent? And so I wrote Dissent, The History of an American Idea, which was published in 2015. It took probably about 10 years to write that book. It was really a long effort. And so this new book, American Patriots, really got started when when I was watching some of the January 6th insurrection. And, and afterwards, all of these, so many of these congressmen who had been hiding under their desks or hiding in the cellar afterwards were saying, oh, well, they were just dissenters, you know, protesting. And I thought, no, they were not. And uh, so that kind of germinated this whole thing. I mean, I, I began to redefine how I thought about dissent. Dissent, to me, had always been going against the grain uh, and protesting against what is, whatever that is, is. But with January 6th, you know, it was based on lies. It wasn't legitimate. It wasn't like... You know, they had these people have been experiencing years of uh, discrimination and segregation. It was based on the lie that the election was stolen. And when you look at some of the video, it kind of reminds me of 
you know, Don Quixote charging windmills. They're just kind of, you know, protesting against uh, an unreality and untruth. So uh, this is, and then also when I wanted to deal with that in this new book, I also wanted to deal with uh, primarily the dissent that took place since 2015 when my other book was published. And as you know, there was a lot, there's been a lot of dissent in the last eight years. Sure. I mean, the point you bring up is important because, um, you know, dissent like progress is a contested concept. Mm -hmm. And like you were alluding to, like, you know, a lot of these January Sixers or or their supporters um, think of themselves as dissidents, Mm -hmm. right? So how, how would you define dissent? Well, one of the things that I, I think about and what kind of made me narrow down my definition. My definition had basically been anybody who's protesting against anything is a dissenter. But there, you know, it seems after a while that just like people do frivolous lawsuits, there's frivolous dissent. You know, they're protesting against something that maybe only affects them. And so I began thinking, you know, why is it that dissent, the right to dissent is in the First Amendment? And, and of course, James Madison and the others who were putting together the Constitution, they were very well aware that this was an experiment to see if a country of we the people, where the people are sovereign, that people could could run a, a government. And in order to do this, you know, one of the things that was necessary was to put this Bill of Rights in the Constitution so that people know what rights they're getting for basically agreeing to obey by the laws of this new United States, this new republic. And it struck me that they, the founding fathers realized that you know the American Revolution was a product of dissent, the United States itself was a product of dissent, that by putting dissent in the First Amendment, uh, it's telling the people that if you are not receiving your rights, if you feel that your rights are not being protected, then you have the right to protest for that. And in fact, it even becomes the duty to protest for rights, because what you're doing is you you are pushing the United States to live up to its own moral code. Dissent that is about advancing the rights, the you know, these you know, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence made very clear that everybody is equal before the law. And so if you are not, or if there's a group of people that are not, you have to protest for that. But it doesn't mean that you should protest to take away rights from other people. Because what the United States, you know, it uh, it basically committed itself to protecting rights for everybody. And, and just to be clear for the listener, um, you know, in in your book, you, you write that, you know, uh, dissent isn't the property of any one political party, right? Mm-hmm. It transcends politics. You know, and then when writing about Vietnam, that serves as an, you write that that serves as an example of this uh, political spectrum that dissent can embody. And so like with the Vietnam War, with anti-war protesters, I mean, you had radicals denouncing the war as an expression of U.S. imperialism, right? Maybe like more liberal dovish protesters um, arguing that the war was immoral. Well, there was actually conservatives opposed to the war, maybe because of an isolationist kind of you know, foreign policy viewpoint, or they just thought we were losing. <laughs> there right. was nothing to gain. But I'm wondering now, because we're seeing kind of the right co-opt anti-war positions. Do, do you think there's a danger in this like cross-pollinization of the, this opposition to war, whether it's like supporting Ukraine or other parts of the world? Because, you know, we've seen people from the left and the far left to people on the right, like Tucker Carlson, or even like, you know, white supremacists and white nationalist groups kind of infiltrating the anti-war movement to use it as a vehicle to kind of like shepherd people into their, you know, reactionary uh, supremacist movements. Well, you know, it, that's a very complicated kind of issue. The whole thing is the, there are people that uh, have opposed wars, you know, basically from an isolationist standpoint. And then, and, and, and of course, you know, I think back to like the Spanish-American War. And when the Spanish-American War came to an end, we took over the Philippines. And there were many people that were against taking over the Philippines because it was going against the basic American principle of 
uh, the consent of the governed. We're taking over this other group of people and uh, telling them how they're going to be running their country, how we're going to be running it for them. But there are also people who were basically white supremacists who did not want to take over the Philippines because then it would be adding to the American population all of these dark-skinned people from the Philippines. Uh, You also had people that, uh, like Andrew Carnegie, was against taking over the Philippines not because, and you would, that's sort of surprising in a way, but he basically did believe in economic imperialism, but not in military or political imperialism where we would be taking over the country. So, you know, in every war and every conflict, uh, there are people that are uh, opposed to it for a variety of reasons. Now, of course, the Ukraine war uh, with, you know, with the Russian invasion that actually, in one way, has nothing to do with the United States. We're, it's not our war, but it goes along with the attitudes that we've had ever since Rose, Franklin Roosevelt was president, that when you know, a, a, a country that has been invaded, that is a victim of aggression, uh, it may be, not always, but maybe becomes the moral duty of the United States to stand up for the oppressed in this case. What's happening, I think, with you know the Tucker Carlsons and, and the others, this kind of fits in with uh, this Trumpist mentality of you know admiring dictators, admiring Putin and such. Uh, and I don't think somebody like Tucker Carlson has really an opinion one way or the other about what happens in Ukraine. But if it's a, a vehicle in which to get George uh, to get uh, Trump back into the White House. That's the political motive there. It's not really, I think, anything uh, like a pacifist or a moral objection to war. So when when you wrote this book, American Patriots, what did did you want readers to take away from it? Or what do you want readers to take away from it? Well, I want readers to take away the fact that dissent gave birth to this nation and that it's one of the most uh, defining characteristics of the American people. It's in our DNA. You know, you had in the 17th century, you had religious dissenters like Quakers and Puritans coming over here. And within a couple of years of their founding, like Massachusetts Bay Colony, you had Roger Williams protesting against the powers that be and in, in, of the magistrates and the ministers in the colony, where he's protesting for separation of church and state and the, and religious liberty, which the Puritans were not particularly interested in at that time. You know, they came for their own religious liberty, but not for the concept of religious liberty. In the 18th century, you had political dissenters protesting against Britain's policies. And that, of course, led to the American Revolution. And then we put it into the First Amendment. And Americans have been protesting ever since. You know, women protesting for the right to vote, abolitionists protesting against slavery, workers protesting for the right to unionize. And so, you know, all through our history, you know, and every a minority group has protested for their rights that were guaranteed to them by the Constitution. You know, Martin Luther King said in his last speech that uh, all we are saying is for America to live what it, live up to what it put down on paper, and uh, he, you know, very eloquently states this. And most dissenters all throughout our history quote from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to support their viewpoint. Dissent is basically you know as American as apple pie, you know, or cherry pie, or whatever pie you want. Uh, and it's um, and when people tell people who are protesting that they're being un-American or if you don't like it, leave it, you know, love it or leave it. That's a lot of bull. You know, it's it's probably one of the most you know, important characteristics of being an American. But, you know, but with that said, of course, another thing that's been a long tradition in American history is white supremacy often accomplished by violence, like with the Ku Klux Klan and the lynchings and such. So you have dissenters and this whole thing about white supremacy, which a lot of dissenters have been protesting against. The, they kind of clash, and it was kind of a perfect thing, you know, what's happening recently with the, when Black Lives Matter, people were taking to the streets, and then you had these right-wingers going out, protesting against them and driving their cars into crowds and killing people. It's all, you know, kind of 
very American in a way. I'm I'm wondering, do do you have a favorite period of descent that you've written about? Well, there there are a few. I mean, I really like um, the um, during the early Republic with the Transcendentalist movement, uh, which you know spawned Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, which has become really sort of the Bible for dissenters. And it really helped strengthen both the abolitionist movement and the women's movement, uh, what the transcendentalists and other reformers were talking about then. Uh, of course, I'm very partial to the 60s since they were what formed me. And, uh, you know, so this is some, you know, you know, another period. But there's also, you know, the progressive period during uh, the first 20 years of the 20th century uh, with... Um, you know, the fight, uh, you know, when women's suffrage finally became a reality and also, you know, people like Mother Jones fighting against the exploitation of children and wanting the government to do something about child labor. Uh, you had Ida B. Wells Barnett writing her pamphlets and articles denouncing lynching and demanding that the federal government uh, create a federal law against lynching because no local jury in the South was ever going to convict a white person for killing a black person. And it had to be a federal law to, to try to dissuade that, you know, people from doing that. And in 1900, one congressman first introduced the first anti-lynching bill. And over the next 122 years, over 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced and they all were defeated until February of 2022, when the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill became law. So now we finally do have a, a federal law. You know, that period in which this was first being broached is something that was another very period in American history. Could you talk a little bit about how, you know, being in part, being part of these protests and movements in the 60s shaped you? Because, you know, I know it can have a profound impact. I was kind of you know, radicalized through the WTO protests. I was mm -hmm. living in Seattle at the time mm -hmm. um, and kind of was involved with those, you know, with, with the protests for the four days, four or five days um, during the ministerial meeting where tens of thousands of people from, you know, around the globe, really, um, kind of representing all walks of life from, you know, Quakers, a trade unionist, environmentalists, you know, like they said that Teamsters and Turtles were marching together, which was, you know, a, a, an uneasy coalition, maybe at least at the time. But that, you know, for being part of that, witnessing that, kind of learning from that, going to not just the protests, but the, the workshops and the teach-ins and just talking mm -hmm. to people next to me. I mean, that just really had a profound impact on me and kind of, I, I know it set me down the path that, you know, led me to kind of editing this progressive publication, the Bucks County Beacon. So could you, you know, let listeners in about how, you know, the 60s and, and living during those tumultuous times kind of shaped you? Well, you know, it just, you know, everything came together. I know, you know, in the late 50s, for example, I wasn't, you know, I was still in, in high school and, and I wasn't really paying that much attention to it. You know, one, one of the things we, we were taught in the 50s, doing the Pledge of Allegiance and all this, we were taught all the time that the United States is the greatest country on earth uh, because everybody is free and equal and the Soviet Union is this evil empire and such. You know, I love that. I thought, you know, growing up, how lucky I am, how wonderful to be an American, to be in the greatest country on earth because we're all free and equal. And then you turn on the television in September 1957 and you see nine black kids being escorted into Little Rock Central High School with the United States Army guarding them. And something doesn't gel about that. And it was like this thought you had, everybody, we're, this is the greatest country because everybody's free and equal, but it's not true. And I think this was something that for me and probably my, my generation, you know, just both maybe consciously and unconsciously just spurred on the 1960s because so many of us, like I felt, you know, this is the greatest country, but it's, we're not there yet. So let's do what we can to make the reality in the United States more closely resemble the ideal image we have of ourselves. You know, this image that's based on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. 
and then you know I started paying much more attention to what was going on, and you know the, you see the sit-ins in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and then the, the Freedom Rides, uh, and Freedom Summer in 1964, and then with civil rights workers being murdered, uh, all of this just built up in me, and I was just I was getting more and more involved in this, and certainly going to teach-ins and discussions and just talking with my friends and then with Vietnam coming on the scene, you know, being 1A and could be get drafted at any moment. What am I going to do if I get drafted when I'm opposing this war? And, you know, this all, it just built up. I mean, so that by the time you get to uh, the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, you know, you're just about ready to explode in trying to make things change because here, here we're trying to do things through the political process and the people keep getting assassinated. And um, so it was very, it was very invigorating, energizing, and also discouraging all at the same time. But I was, I committed myself to that and I'm, I'm still, I still believe in those things, even though I, I tell my students I'm kind of an anachronism now, I guess. I mean, so is your book a challenge to American exceptionalism or is it just a kind of a, a retelling or a redefining of it in that, you know, American exceptionalism doesn't mean that that doesn't mean the myth that we're perfect or a perfect nation, but it's the movements, the various social movements that strive to create a more perfect union in the country that makes us exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, this whole thing about American exceptionalism is something that is hotly debated. And, you know, most historians really reject this because, it was, you know, so much of it has been based on the Frederick Jackson Turner uh, frontier thesis. You know, it wasn't that we were spreading democracy into the frontier area. It was we were basically taking over this land from the people that were living there. So, you know, American exceptionalism there are certain things about this country. I mean, for, for example, you know, we have this constitution and we've kind of set ourselves up that we are exceptional, but does this mean we need to spread our ideas to other countries around the world? This has been something that's kind of really been go, a, a strain going through American history. When when John Winthrop gave his speech, his, his sermon about, you know, Boston will be a city upon a hill and the light from that beacon will enlighten the world and all. And, you know, we've done this, you know, the founding fathers knew that the revolution was something exceptional and that it would influence other places. And we know it did influence the French Revolution and, and so many others. And then you had Lincoln saying that the United States is the last best hope of earth and that if we, the Civil War did breaks up the nation, it will be a disaster for the, for the world, that it will prove that democracy cannot survive, cannot flourish. You know, Woodrow Wilson, war, World War I, the, world to save the, the war to make the world safe for democracy, or all during the Cold War, we're just trying to prove to the, you know, the world that the United States system is much better than any kind of communist or socialist system. So we've always been pushing for these kinds of things. The, the fact that you know, people in the United States are guaranteed this right to dissent is a pretty special thing too, but still you know, other countries you know, do plenty of dissent, you know, whether it's in Africa or Europe or South America. You know, the, this idea of dissenting against the powers that be is somewhat contagious. Yeah, I mean, you know, myself, I personally haven't been a big believer or fan of the of the whole concept. But, you know, go, going to your the point you just made about, like, having this right to dissent, I mean, it, it's not exactly openly embraced. Like, for example, the WTO protests, I mean, they declared martial law, right? You know, they set a curfew, um, they set in National Guard, there is tear gas, hundreds of, you know, frivolous arrests. I mean, if something like that happened in Cuba, you know, it would just, you know, be all the rage in the news. But in Seattle, at the time, at least, you know, any kind of critical media coverage about the way the protests were kind of oppressed or suppressed or repressed didn't make much 
much news. And, you know, there's always been the kind of, you know, government um, infiltration of movements, like what mm -hmm. you've talked about in your book through, uh, you know, COINTELPRO, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I don't personally, I don't understand this obsession with being the greatest. I mean, you can love your country, recognize it, it's imperfect and then work to make it better. But it's it's something that's, you know, many people are still kind of obsessed with, because if you're if you pay attention to these like school board wars and school board issues, mm -hmm. I mean, here in Bucks County, in Penridge, the school board um, members were complaining that students weren't being taught that we are the greatest country in the world. And that's like what they view as the whole point of education and being taught history in K through 12 public schools. So, yeah, the, you know, basically the United States is, uh, what was it that um, Martin Luther King said something about that, that American democracy is an unkept promise and that we are just trying, you know, and this is, I think, is a very good thing about the United States is that people are trying to make the country live up to this promise. You know, we want to have uh, everybody enjoying, you know, the the rights that we think are so special, that are so exceptional. But there are a lot of people that look at equal rights as something like, um, you know, a zero sum game that if somebody gets more equality, they lose their equality. And that's just not, to me, I think that what is good for one group of people, it, it needs to coincide with what's good for everybody. And this is what will, you know, if everybody's equal in this, in this country, then we are better off for that. One of the things that civil rights activists that went down into the South and, and put their lives on the line for the civil rights movement. They were, you know, one of the common phrases that so many of these, like the white kids that were going down there for Freedom Summer were saying that, you know, uh, if, if, if one group of people is not free in this country, then it jeopardizes all of us. Then, you know, I'm not free. I'm fighting for my rights just as much I am as I am fighting for African-American rights. So, so campuses have always kind of been hotbeds of, you know, activism and dissent. Um, you know, one of the movements you write about in, in your book is the Berkeley free speech movement. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe how that movement or, or someone like Mario, Mario Savio might view free speech on campuses today, which are hotly contested areas right now. Yeah, it was... Um... You know, it's a kind of a, an interesting thing that, you know, with all of this, people are so concerned about these people with, you know, that are espousing hate speech and all of this. But at, at, you know, at some point you need to, what, what makes a, a, an education valuable at a university level is that you're exposed to all sorts of ideas and you debate them, you argue them. I remember... You know, when, when I was doing my graduate work at Michigan State University, there was always different people coming in to give speech, speeches and such. And I went to so many of them. I went to, I saw Martin Luther King there. I saw Stokely Carmichael, Timothy Leary, you know, people with, you know, very different ideas about things. But there were, you know, and there were for some people that was controversial. And one time there was even George Lincoln Rockwell, who was the head of the American Nazi Party. And I went down to see that. And of course, I was very totally against him. But one of the things that was so cool is uh, there were people outside, you know, handing out flyers. And a lot, of the, a lot of the students at Michigan State really protested that George Lincoln Rockwell was even giving a speech there. And, and some groups of students were handing out flyers. And I, I wish I had kept one. It was really great. He said, you know, it tells all about the terrible things that George Lincoln Rockwell believes. At the end, is it, is it really George Lincoln Rockwell we hate or a reflection of ourselves? Wow. And I thought, you know, this, I think this is something that people need to take into consideration now when they're opposed to people coming to their campus to speak, say, uh, about, you know, the pro-Palestinian cause or uh, a, a, a very strong, you know, a right-wing cause or something, you know, just... You have to kind of listen to all of these things, and um, and and then you you can if you're really honest with yourself, you can see where somebody is 
you know, a threat or a bogus or a basket case, whatever you want to call it, or if they're really speaking truth to power. No, that's interesting. I mean, you know, this is it's something I kind of, you know, still grapple with trying to figure out where, where I stand on, on this issue, but you think it's better to kind of let these people have access. And that's not to say that people can't protest them, right? Right. right. But it's better to kind of allow them to speak on campus and just allow that debate, um, even if it's someone, you know, say from the Proud Boys or, or some kind of, you know, Nazi party, like you were talking about Rockwell. It's it, one of the most important things is to learn to listen. And I've been running these teachings at, at Temple, and sometimes they can get kind of heated, you know, d- discussing things. And once in a while, I have to remind students that to, to listen deeply to what somebody's saying is a real art. And what you want to do is, you know, or, or think about is that for many times when people are having an argument, you know, if I'm arguing with you and I don't agree with what you're saying, I'm not even listening to it anymore. I'm already thinking of my response. I'm thinking, you know, you know and, and this is what happens. So often people you know, might be hearing each other, but they're not really listening to each other. And you need to listen because you maybe then can at least understand where somebody whose view you completely disagree with, you at least begin to understand where they're coming from and maybe get some kind of empathy for, for their position and to understand it a bit better. And then one can maybe have a dialogue in which you can you know, maybe agree to disagree, but at least respect each other's point of view, even as, ab- ab- as abhorrent as their point of view might be to you. I think these are just important skills that we all need to. I mean, that's what I can't wrap my head around, though, to, to a certain extent is like, you know, how do you empathize with a fascist? Right, or like, right. right. You know, how do you empathize with Hitler? You know, and uh, so it's, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not like disqualifying it, but. Like, like so often people will say, oh, well, the truth lies somewhere in the, in the middle. That's bogus, too, because, you know, where is the middle about slavery or about the Holocaust? You know, you know it certainly hate speech when somebody is going out and, and, and demanding that, you know, we execute somebody or lynch him or lynch Mike Pence or whatever it is. These are, are things that, you know, do need to be shunned. Or, I mean, even in Texas, right, with that one of the school districts, they were talking about teaching both sides of the Holocaust, right? Like, this is oh, yeah. you know, this is the moment we live in right now. Um, okay, so two, two more questions for you, Ralph. Um, first, as a historian of dissent, how would you characterize the state of modern dissent today? Well, it's, it's certainly alive. I don't know how well it is, uh, but it's something that one, one thing we do know here in, in 2024 is that dissent will continue. We don't know what the next dissent movement is going to be necessarily or how things are going to develop, but you know, people will always find causes to fight for or against, and so there will always be dissent. I think it's, you know, you know, having witnessed the 1960s and the amount of protests and, you know, the really incredible things that were going on. And then by the 80s and 90s, there weren't so many of these things. But then after September 11th, so much of the time since, you know, in the last 23 years, I've thought we're kind of almost heading back into the 1960s. You know, people are really going out to the streets and protesting. I think one of the things that dissenters do is that they learn from previous dissent groups. You know, they learn you know, like what works and what doesn't work. And they try to to work on these things. But also at the same time, the authorities have learned from the past too. And like, you know, sometimes when there's like a democratic convention or a republic convention and they're expecting protesters, the city will have a free speech zone, you know, where you can, you can protest in this place. You know, it's like a, maybe a mile from the convention center or something, and it's behind you know, in a cage or something. It's, and of course, there's nothing in the Constitution about free speech zones. Uh, but it's something that the, basically police forces figure this is one way to contain it. And also, a lot of them have learned that you don't go like Bull Connor 
you know, sicking dogs on people and, and, you know, it's always going in bashing heads right and left, although that still happens. Uh, but, you know, most police forces have learned to use some constraint to, so as to not, you know, be, be seen as the bad guy, as it were. And, and then finally, if you could bring back three dissidents from history to help navigate the nation through the perilous times we find ourselves in, who would it be and why? You know, one of the things I thought, you know, when September 11th happened and, you know, George W. Bush was president, and, and you knew, I mean, I knew immediately that day, there was a, we're going to go bomb somebody. We're just going to retaliate. And it really needed much more thoughtful approach. Like, why is it? What is it about American foreign policy that has led to this moment? And I remember thinking, longing for a Martin Luther King or an Abraham Lincoln or a Franklin D. Roosevelt or somebody like that to be leading the country and not George W. Bush. And certainly today, you know, not somebody like Trump. I mean, it would it would just be some knee jerk reaction that wouldn't be thoughtful. And so you really look for wisdom in this. Uh, as far as dissenters, there are so many that I've I've I've, le- I've learned so much teaching this course and writing these books. I mean, I've learned about dissenters I never had heard of before. You know, and I, I know like you know like Ida B. Wells Barnett. Uh, Randolph Bourne, who protested very eloquently against World War I, uh, Eugene V. Debs, uh, certainly, you know, some of the famous people that we know of, like Martin Luther King or Pete Seeger, using music to w- awaken people's consciousness. And, and of course, you know, that's another important thing about dissent, the, the methods that people use to get their message out. Okay. Well, Ralph, thanks so much. I I really enjoyed this conversation about Descent with you. I I want to encourage listeners to go to your local bookstore, pick up a copy of American Patriots, A Short History of Descent, and read it. You won't be disappointed. And Ralph, thanks again for coming on The Signal. Well, thank you for having me. This has been The Signal, a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm Cyril McGlego, Editor-in-Chief and Host. For more progressive news, analysis, and opinion from Bucks County and beyond, go to www.buckscountybeacon.com.